so yeah, I, I will be presenting the social and economic fabric of decentralized space development. Um, so a little bit about me, I, he said I co-founded Space Cooperative, so you might be like, what's Space Cooperative, what's Space Decentral? Well, Space Cooperative is the initial uh, worker-owned cooperative that we formed in 2016, and um, that led eventually towards Space Decentral. This uh, futurist, Julio Prisco, wrote an article on Medium called a Decentralized Autonomous Space Agency. So that was about you know five uh, five months after we formed. So we decided to we just met on the internet and started collaborating, and uh, we decided to converge converge visions essentially. And we didn't even meet in person until about like one month ago. So um, whenever he came to California to you know visit his daughter, but um, basically um, whenever we formed the company, the the vision was creating a space mission collaboration platform so we can crowdsource and crowdfund space missions. And whenever Julio uh, laid out you know, the concept of a space DAO in this article, it made so much sense because you know, it's like you can utilize the, the transparent nature and the coordination mechanisms that you know, smart contracts uh, provide to allow that um, you know, connection to happen and to, to allow it to be so we're not you know, the, the only organization in control of how the space agency is gonna operate. So a lot of people you know, might say, well, you know, why, why focus on space when there are so many problems on Earth? And uh, what I often say is you know, there, are, there are a lot of reasons why space actually benefits Earth. First, you know, if we're exploring the universe, we're we're learning things about you know humanity that we don't know before. Whether like you know life exists outside of Earth, it's like there are so many you know galaxies out there, and it would be amazing to actually explore them. Um, the second thing, as far as like you know knowledge and and understanding goes, is you know space is such a har harsh environment that it's also an, another way to actually advance knowledge and technology to be able to live in these harsh environments. And through these um, experiments, you actually, are, and through developing these technologies, you actually, um, there are like spin-off technologies that are applicable to Earth too. Like for example, uh, insulation that's used in a lot of housing, you know, that was initially for space because of the, you know, extreme temperatures. Um, and the other thing as far as like, you know, climate change, we wouldn't know about climate change or how the temperature of the Earth has been changing if it wasn't for satellite technology. And then like GPS constellation, it's like we still use that every day. I know there's foam, you know, that is attempting to replace it in ways, but I think it'll probably be a long time until that actually becomes fully mainstream. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, asteroid mining. You probably heard the news yesterday that Consensus just acquired an asteroid mining firm, um, which is very interesting. We'll talk more about that later. But um, there are a lot of benefits as far as like asteroid mining goes because it's like we live in Earth and it's always like, you know, it's, it's this mindset of scarcity. Um, so with asteroid mining, we can, you know, move towards more post scarcity as far as like, oh my God, there are so many resources outside Earth. And the same uh, mentality goes as far as like colonizing or settling on other planets. Um, okay, so that's like a little bit of background for, you know, why space is important besides like, the fantasy and allure of truly becoming a spacefaring civilization. Um, so what is Space Decentral? It's a decentralized autonomous agency and we're aiming to essentially reinvigorate the push for, um, sorry, for space exploration with global citizens in control. So it's decentralized because no single corporation or nation will be responsible for its management. It's autonomous because member control over how mem members will control over how work is directed, how decisions are made, and which projects to fund. And it's a space agency because it's going to be very strategic. You know, it's like the network will decide. You know, which which programs to fund, which projects to develop. So it's like if you combine these uh, these three, you get like you know you can we can tap into the the curiosity that's you know in our Human, it's in our evolution to explore. We can like finally, if, if you have like the drive and the motivation to actually want to work on space, it's like you can participate in it. It's like, it's like how, how do we make it so anyone can like work on space? It's such like a fascinating thing. I hope I can do it for the rest of my life. Like how can we enable anyone to participate? That's what we want to do. And essentially it's like, you know, citizen led through that. And through this combination, it's about expansion, expansion, you know, to throughout the universe, expansion of our knowledge, like expansion of 
of like humanity in general. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about aerospace crowd history as far as like crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. Um, and that will so sort of lead towards the transition of talking about the X Prize and then um, Space Decentral. And then I'm gonna talk about phase one of how Space De Decentral is initially working right now. And then the phase two of how it ideally will work. So the history of crowdsourcing in aerospace, it can, um, Kind of, it starts in, nine, in the 1900s with the Deutsche Prize, and that was a $100,000 um, fr French franc prize for the first airship to fly from the Parc St. Cloud to the Eiffel Tower and back in under 30 minutes, so it was about 11 kilometers total. Um, and the winner of that was uh, Alberto Santos Dumont, and he was a Brazilian. Um, and then there might have been like a lot of other prizes in between them, but uh, some of the most significant recent ones were the Ansari X Prize, and that was the first X Prize in 1996, and that was a $10 million prize for the first non-governmental organization um, to launch a reusable manned spacecraft into space, um, you know, twice within two weeks, and that prize was actually awarded. Um, that took about eight years. And then the most recent one that um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about was the Google Lunar X Prize, and that lasted from 2007 to 2018, um, and it was a $30 million prize, um, and that was for you know landing a robot on the surface of the moon and traveling 500 meters over the surface and sending the images and data back to Earth. And what happened was nobody actually won that prize, but all of these companies were formed through that process that have received way more funding than the prize even was. Um, and there are a few examples that um, I think are significant. I had a typo on the first one, but um, that should be Space IL, um, and that was the Israeli group, and they were a nonprofit, but they were able to actually um, received $95 million of funding from various sources, such as um, philanthropists like uh, Sheldon uh, Al. Al Sheldon Adelson, who donated 16.4 million, and also some of the leaders of the group that you know had wealth. Um, iSpace was a Japanese organization, and they actually just recently secured 92 million dollars in funding. Um, and Moon Express um, is also like a for-profit based business, and they've received a total of 65 million dollars worth of funding. So even though none of these organizations actually won the prize, it's like there was you know a lot of advancement in technology that will enable other people to use these uh, landers that a lot of them have built to actually get to the moon um, you know, faster and more efficiently. And then as far as like the history of crowdfunding in aerospace goes, um, one of the first successful examples was Planetary Resources ARCID uh, spacecraft. And um, the, the reward that they were giving on uh, Kickstarter was you can take your self-portrait while this uh, spacecraft is traveling through space. Um, and that campaign happened in 2013, but actually in 2016, they decided to cancel it and give everyone their money back because there wasn't really enough support to fully go through with that mission. Um, and then the other example was a Planetary Society's light sail, and that was like a a solar sailing type spacecraft, and um, it's, a, it's to use a solar sail as a propulsion mechanism. And that first mission, there was also a, some failure associated with it. Um, and then another more recent one has to do with a telescope, and that was in 2017. Um, it's like a more of a personal telescope, and that was a $2.2 million campaign. So these are like quite small um, as far as like citizen crowdfunding goes, but you can also think of the X Prize as a crowdfunding mechanism, since, for example, the um, the Google Lunar X Prize that was sponsored by Google. So it's like larger organizations can actually collectively potentially sponsor um, uh, larger prizes. And this is where we can start to talk about Space Decentral and what we're up to. So right now uh, we have a lunar program called Coral, and it's a open source uh, lunar space program, and the objective is to essentially demonstra demonstrate in situ resource utilization technology, or ISRU, to 3D print on the, lunar, um, on the lunar surface using essentially moon dust or regolith as the feedstock of what goes into the 3D printer. Um, and then, so this is our flagship mission. It was selected by 
the founders of the um, of Space Decentral or Space Cooperative, um, but I'll talk more in the future about how we'll select um, the next missions. So whenever we asked uh, a lot of the community about why they joined this mission, um, you know, what mo mo what motivated you to join? Like, these were the different responses that we got. You know, some some were just want to make friends with like-minded people. They're just as simple as like space, a, a chance to participate in something new, to be an asset to society. Um, and then there were other uh, responses that were more related towards you know the the, the mission at hand, which was interested interest in space resource utilization or potential for adv advancing interesting lunar projects. Um, so we launched this around July, and like I said, this is our first mission, and our first mission is actually not just the founders of the company, but it is the global community. Um, so there are people participating right now from India, from Australia, um, from Sweden, as far as like their nationalities go, from the UK, Canada, a lot from the US and also Puerto Rico um, and Brazil. So, uh, so the people you see in this photo, these are like some of the um, people that were part of, part of Space Cooperative, um, but but then also the people that are part of Space Cooperative and Space Decentral as a community as well. So, how does it initially work? Um, we don't operate on the Ethereum blockchain today, but that's the phase two that I'll talk about next. Um, so right now we have spacedecentral.net. It's a social network that we host, um, and it's this is just like the first iteration of it. It's very basic. It has a forum. You know, it's connected to Google Drive because that's what a lot of us still use as far as document collaboration goes. Um, and then we do our task management in GitHub. So this is like uh, some of the tasks for our coral mission right now. You can see it's like you know writing reports on the manufacturing methods or the different trade studies. Uh, and you know, maintaining the document library. Um, here's an example of uh, like a trade study that the community is working on right now to determine the manufacturing method, whether it's like microwave sintering, solar sintering. Um, so th this is just like a collaboration of all those people that I showed you before. <clears throat> and this is another like uh, interesting one. There was like a task to design a logo, and like we got like first that one, and then someone submitted that one, and then this is the most recent one we got on the right. And there wasn't even any like bounty associated with this. It was just like, hey, like someone they still people were still doing it even though there wasn't any money associated to it. And that's like the interesting part as far as like working on space projects go, because uh, I actually wanted to talk more about the um, the Israeli organization Space IL. Uh, like I said, they had 95 million in funding. <clears throat> And they only had they had 30 paid members, but 200 plus volunteers. So, so that's like the interesting like composition of actually forming it as a nonprofit because you can, because uh, there are people that want to work on space that don't actually care about getting paid for it, and that's that's exciting. Like, um, I mean, I've, I've I've been working on this for two years, and I've I've like you know self-funded it off of some like some Ethereum um, after I purchased it after the DAO hack. But um, so yeah, it's like, I, I, didn't, I didn't put my money into it because I thought I was gonna get rich. I, just, I was just like, this is, I, I heard the calling and I'm like, this is what I wanna work on. And then you start to see other people wanna work on it. And it's not because they think they're gonna get rich. <clears throat> so how will it ideally work? So this is how a space mission works for NASA. You see it's, it's highly complex. Um, if we build an international space agency, um, it's not like we have to copy everything that NASA does. You want to innovate, make it a little bit more agile. But the reason that like, the, the process of developing a space mission like this has all these different you know, milestones, critical design reviews, a lot of different design reviews as you advance from developing a concept to actually like doing the system design to starting to prototype the hardware. Um, I mean, that's why you, NASA missions, they don't fail that much as far as like all the ones that have gone to Mars or, um, you know, the recent one, like, or, or the moon. A lot of other, you know, countries have tried to go to Mars but haven't made it there. So. Um, so this is just uh, like an example of, okay, well, how are we gonna translate all of these processes like to the blockchain? And this is where you can start to see, okay, you know, smart contracts might help with like uh, how you assign peer reviewers or how you release funding as uh, you, advance the, you, you advance up the different milestones or maybe how you find 
um, teams to replace an existing team if they're not able to you know, successfully deliver on like the prototypes. So Spacey Central, we want to build a space agency in a box. Like, we want to have the tool set so we can create an international citizen-led space agency, but at the same time, like, we, we think this tool set can also be used by nation states that don't have space agencies yet. You know, how, how do we actually enable more nations to become space-faring, like the developing nations? Because I think that that's really the way to truly like balance the power is like giving as many people in the world access to the technologies, like the freedom to explore the universe. Um, and that's why a lot of our you know ideologies and missions are also based on doing as much as we can in an open source manner, like building a knowledge base that has you know all the, a lot of the education that you need, a lot of the different tools that you'll need. Um, there are actually a lot of open source tools out there already, but there's no you know cohesive like enterprise suite or you know space enterprise suite that makes it actually easy to use every tool. And um, for for what we want to build, you know, Ethereum will be the underlying like you know blockchain that everything will then layer on top of and. Um, and we've made a decision to utilize Aragon as far as our, you know, DAP framework and governance goes because of a lot of like the shared ideologies and, you know, it's like a lot of people say, oh, Aragon, it's really complex. And like I showed you that graph before, we're like, that's great. It's gonna, it can, <laughs> it can support a lot of the use cases that we need. We we need to build a complex system, and maybe to build it, you need a, you know, robust tool set. Um, so. So um, now I'll talk a little bit more about like how uh, the ecosystem works with the tokens. And um, the, this uh, example that I go through right now, it's like, like I said, we're gonna be using Aragon. And this, uh, this, how this ecosystem works with the two tokens, a lot of different organizations that want to do crowdsourcing, like combining crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and you know, like volunteer-driven projects can also use the same model. So you, know, you can rename the tokens, like, do the same thing. There's nothing uh, space specific about like this initial mechanism, but you know, essentially we'll have a faster than light FTL. That's our transferable token can be purchased, and it'll be staked for governance rights. And it's also used to prioritize programs. So it has like a unique capability for um, you know, this is like one. There's like one main token weighted vote, and that's to select the programs. So you could think of it as similar to you know, companies deciding which X prize they want to fund. You know, they're like, well, if I'm gonna put 30 million in, I want to choose that it's gonna be like a lunar prize. So it's at the very high level. Not, not saying that they have the ability to actually choose the winning team of that prize, but actually to fund it the higher level, like people that are passionate about initiatives. And then the other token we have is the Space Decentral Network Token, or SDN, and that will be earned by people that are actually contributing to the space projects. Um, you know, they're, uh, <clears throat> they're working on the, the projects, they're earning these tokens, and, and this is like, important because, like I said, there are, there are gonna be a lot of volunteer-driven projects, and you're not gonna have like, all this like, FTL to give to every project, but you want to give every, give, give a SDN token at least, or SDN tokens for every task that is completed, and that can later be like an accounting tool that you use to distribute FTL whenever, uh, or uh, ETH or other sources of funding as it comes in in the future to the project. So as far as our uh, space mission, uh, uh, sorry, okay, so, so like I said, we selected the, we selected Coral as our first mission, but right now, to select our subsequent missions, we have the, the space mission activation process, and that's actually uh, going on right now, and, um, and we're, we're gonna, and this is where we're gonna start to use Aragon to select our next missions, but essentially right now, people are just um, developing proposals, submitting them, and then uh, through the tasks that people are working on on Coral, we'll be awarding SDN tokens. And then if you collect a minimum amount of that, you'll be able to participate in the activation votes for the next missions on the network. Um, so, and then if your idea gets selected, you also get more SDN tokens. And then, this is like the, the unique part of it is, you know, with the XPRIZE, it's a lot of different teams competing. Um, but with this, we wanna make it like, 
if you if your if your mission was selected as the winning one, it's open for the entire network to still collaborate on it. It's like just because uh, your team might have had a winning proposal doesn't mean that it would just be restricted to your team. But at least there can be like priorities for you know the proposal team, um, at least being able to work on the initial task. And then you know this is how it can work as far as. You know, there, there's a project, there are tasks, um, the tasks have a different SDN, people finish the tasks, and then they collect the, the SDN for it, and then later, whenever there's a reward cycle, they get the FTL uh, reward. And then so, like I said before, we're gonna do this with Aragon, and right now we're developing a planning suite, and uh, the, the code name for it is that planning suite, and there are gonna be six different apps um, or Aragon OS apps, and they'll actually work in combination with um, with the other, like you know, token manager, finance, uh, uh, voting apps that Aragon is already building themselves. And then we want to just like add an additional tool set for you know different types, of, you know, for range voting, for um, being able to um, have like actual consensus voting whenever you're actually estimating how much the tasks are worth. You can, as a project team, come to consensus on the value of it. It's like that's where you don't need the entire like DAO to say how much that task is worth, but the people that are actually just working on it. Um, and then an address book, because uh, not everyone's going to be using ENS in the beginning, but you are going to have like uh, Ethereum addresses that you're regularly sending funds to, so just like an easy way to, to create a, a mapping between a human readable name and an address. Um, a projects app that will actually initially integrate with GitHub, uh, so you can do like a bounty system within Aragon. Um, but eventually, we also want to expand that to a more decentralized Git solution. Like there's a, a tool called Pando being built, um, so that's the eventual migration for that. Um, and uh, and yeah, the rewards app that will uh, be able to support the mechanisms that I just described. Um, so yeah, this is like a design of the tokenized task management that's currently under development. And then, you know, this is the rewards app. And, you know, these are based on design patterns that Aragon has already built, but with, with a little bit, with a few changes um, as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's about it. The un it's unknown what the future holds, but it's up to us to shape it. If you want to collaborate, um, there are details there, and you can also stay in touch.